Hi, my name is Andy Harris. I am the developer and author. I created uh, a library called simplegame.js, which is a library for creating your own games in HTML5 and JavaScript. I've also written a number of books on web development and game development. Today I want to show you this simple game tool that you can use. Uh, it is featured in my latest book, but you don't need the book in order to enjoy it and start playing with it. So we start at the simple game practice.html, which you can find linked from my main website. And uh, you can see right here, uh, you're looking at the web page right now. This is a tool that allows you to play around with the simple game program, whether you uh, are familiar with programming or not. We can just get started. Uh, when you see the website, it's uh, set into a number of different uh, spots. There's some links here that give you documentation, there's three places to put some code, and then there's some buttons at the bottom that allow you to run. There is already a very simple game set up in this uh, tool, so if we just hit the run button we'll be able to see it. When you run, a new window gets popped up. I'll move it over so you can see it. And uh, in this default code, well that window is very simple. All it's doing is it's creating a new window that has a scene in it and a ball is moving along inside that scene. Well that's pretty cool. Let's see how that works. Well the way that Simple Game works is relatively simple. There's three main sections of uh, any document that you want to write. It is embedded in a web page. It uses HTML5 and a language called JavaScript. And of course I'd love to tell you all about those things but for now let's just get something up and running. You see three main segments. We see vars, init, and update. Vars tells you about the variables that we're using. Uh, any program is about variables. Variables can contain simple stuff like numbers and uh, text, words. Uh, or it can contain more complex stuff like the scene, that's the background, and the ball, that's the object that's moving around. So I have two variables in my program, scene and ball. We'll make things more complex later. Now the init is what's called a function. A function is some bag of code. So you take a bunch of commands and you put them together and you make them into what's called a function. We have two main kinds of functions in all the games created with this library. We have an init function and an update function. The init function happens when the game first loads. So anytime you want to start up a game, the things that happen first happen in initialization, which is normally called init. That makes sense. Typically in the init, we'll create things. So we'll get everything started. The other function that you'll always see in a simple game is update. The update is different. The init happens only one time. Update happens 20 times per second. And this is typical for game development. In game development, you create your elements one time, and then you have things that they do over and over and over again, often 15 to 30 times per second. We'll run at 20. That's almost twice as fast as Flash. Um, it's not that as fast as some very high-end programs, but this should still work on all of your various devices, including mobile devices, phones, and so on. All right, so let's take a look at the specifics of this particular program and it is relatively straightforward. Look back at the vars and we'll see that I've created two things. All of the games in Simple Game have two main types of elements. You'll always have a scene. That sets the whole thing up. That's your background. Um, it's the gray box for now. Of course we can change it and make it other colors and other shapes and sizes and so on, but there's the scene. The other type of variable that you'll frequently have is called a sprite. A sprite is the thing that moves around. Sprites are the things that conk into each other and so on in most games. So your zombie, robot, opossums, and all that stuff, they're all sprites typically. All right, well that makes sense. So the first thing we do is just define what our two variables are. Now inside the init, that's where we make the interesting things happen. So inside init is where we'll, uh, we'll start things. And the init function typically looks pretty much the same for all games. The first thing you'll see is this top line. Scene gets new scene. What am I doing? Well, I'm telling the game engine, hey, I need a scene. 
And uh, typically we look at the equal sign, we read that as gets. Uh, we're not talking about comparison here, we're just saying, hey, go make a new scene object, and I'm going to give it the name scene. Now there's a lot of mysterious things going on here. I'd love for you to take a look at the book to realize all of the interesting things that are happening. For, but for now you can say, hey, we're creating a scene object. This was defined by the library. And when we uh, do this, we want to call it lowercase s scene. The case is very important in most programming languages. So you want to make sure that the first scene is lowercase s, the second one is uppercase. Those parentheses indicate, hey, I'm doing something special. This is actually creating a, a special object. Um, you've probably noticed that the end of every line has a semicolon. This isn't absolutely required in JavaScript, but it's a really good idea. All right, so now we take a look at the next line. Now this line actually looks like two lines, and that's just because, well, I reduced the resolution so you could see it easier. Uh, when I make the screen uh, longer, it all fits on one line. What's going on here? Well, here we're making a new sprite. You get it? We made a new scene, and now we make a new sprite. Well, this sprite will give a name. We'll call it a ball because, well, it's a ball. Now, when you create a scene, you don't need a lot of other information. It just says, hey, make a scene. But when we want to make a sprite, we need to tell it a number of things. The first thing we need to tell it is, well, what scene do you belong to? Well, that's pretty obvious. There's only one. So I'll almost always say scene, the scene I just made. This also implies that we typically have to create a scene before we create any sprites. And that makes sense. Now the second parameter is an image. Now here I just found an image file of a ball that I had on my website. Any image you can find anywhere on the internet we can use here. Oh, that's intriguing. So if you already can post stuff up to your website or something, you can do images. If you're working locally off your own machine, you can do any image on your machine. Anything we can find on the internet. In another example, I'll show you some marvelous things that I can build from resources I don't even have to edit. Okay, so if the first parameter is the scene that the sprite belongs to, the second parameter is an image in any of the standard web formats, so that can be ping and gif and jpeg um, and even svg, but typically I'll use ping. The next two parameters are the width and the height in pixels. So I'm going to make it 50 by 50. That's a pretty good size to start with. We can experiment with these things and see what they mean later. So all of this stuff together means, okay, I'm going to create a new sprite called ball. Now nothing happens yet, but I'm telling it how to make a scene, how to make the ball sprite. The last line in init is scene.start. And what this says is, okay, I've done everything, go ahead and start rolling the scene. That's like telling the, telling the projector, okay, roll them. So we're rolling the game, we're starting things off. If you forget this line, nothing will happen. Your program will just sort of sit there. Okay, so scene.start. Init has typically three things. You create the scene, you create your sprites, you start the scene. That's basically how all the inits go. They'll get a little more complicated, but essentially it still follows that pattern. Now update. The update is a special function that will get called uh, 20 times per second. And so the code that we put in there is going to happen a lot. You want to make sure that's relatively efficient so that your game moves at a reasonable speed. Well, I've only got two lines in here, scene.clear and ball.update. Well, I bet you can figure out what they do. Scene.clear, that says, hey, scene, clear yourself. The scene is an object, and what that means is it knows how to do certain things. Gosh, the guy who wrote that library must love you. Um, because he created this thing so it could do interesting stuff. The scene could clear itself. That way it'll um, make things look nicer. In a second I'll take that line out so you can see what it does. Um, but the first thing we typically do in update is clear the scene. That says, hey, erase everything so I can redraw. Now the second line is ball.update. And what that means is this. It says, okay, ball, go draw yourself in your new spot. The ball somehow knows how to move automatically, although we'll change that very soon. And it will calculate a new spot and draw itself 
in that spot. So let's review. Create a scene and a ball. Start up the scene, create the ball, get the whole thing rolling. Every frame, clear the scene, update the ball. Let's run this program again. And you can see a couple of interesting things. Even though we didn't tell the ball how to do it, the ball is moving. Um, the scene is a particular size. Uh, the ball is the size we expected. And interestingly enough, the ball is moving. And then when it leaves the screen, it knows what to do. It wraps. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I wonder if we can change this behavior. Well, of course we can. And that's where things get interesting. Let's try a couple of interesting things here. For example, let's change the speed of the ball. Um, I'm going to make it much slower. So the ball has a special method called set speed. Now, how do you know this? You don't. You have to look it up. I'll show you where to look it up very soon. But for now, you can say, OK, there's a set speed method. And that, well, I'm telling it to run at speed 1. The default speed was 3, so 1 is going to be a bit slower. Let's try it and see what it does. It's still moving, but it's moving more slowly. Oh, this is interesting. Okay, let's try something else. Let's set the speed to 5. And it's running more quickly. Oh, that's interesting. I wonder if we can try other things. Let's try this one ball dot set move angle. Let's set it to 45. Now guess what you think it's going to do and then we'll run it and see if it does that. Oh my goodness, the ball's movement angle is now 45 degrees. So it's moving at 45 degrees and it still wraps at the end of the screen. Well that's pretty interesting. We can change the speed and the angle at which something moves. But wait, there's more. I wonder if we could figure out what to do when it hits the edge of a screen. Well, let's try this. Try that. Alright, so I added in here ball.setBound action. Bounce. Now let's run this and see what it does. Ooh, it bounced when it got to the edge of a screen. Let's see, see the next one. It bounces again. It bounces again. Oh, that's very exciting. So, you can see we can do all kinds of interesting things here by changing um, various parameters. Now, how do we know what to change and what we can do? Well, it's pretty easy. You come over here to the documentation link. I'm going to pull this up in a separate tab and you can see the various objects and all of its properties and methods. Now of course I describe them in much more detail in the book um, but this should be enough if you just want to play. You can't hurt anything. You can play around and see how these various things work and you can figure out why wow, there's lots of different ways to change the sprites behavior. Um, there's different ways to tell it what to do when it hits the edge of the screen. Uh, there's ways of checking to see if two things collide with each other. Okay, let me show you one more really fun thing uh, before we move on. And that is, how do we change this to some other image? Well, it turns out that's pretty easy. I'm going to go to a new tab. I'm going to find um, a picture of, I don't know, how about an emu? One of my favorite birds, because they're always funky looking. Love that guy. Okay, that's pretty good. Let's uh, copy the URL of that image. I come over here and I'll simply change this from saying the ball image to my emu. That's pretty good. You know what, just to be precise, let's go ahead and change the word ball because we're not talking about a ball anymore. We'll change that to bird. Make sure we do that everywhere. If you forget to change it somewhere, well, things won't work. Alright, so that looks pretty good. I'm going to run it. And there you can see my bird. 
Well, it's bouncing. That's pretty weird. I'm not sure I like that. But let's keep moving. Um, let's try this. Let's leave its bound action at the default wrap. And let's change the bird's size so he's easier to see. All right, now we'll run that and see what we're seeing. Oh, I like that. So there is the bird, and I don't know why he's doing that, but that's what he's doing. Okay, that's pretty fun, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it really is. Now, you should play with this. Get to this website and mess around and change some things around and have some fun. And when, you're, uh, when you've got it the way you want, now you can take this code here in this gray area, and you can copy and paste that and save it to a text file, you know, with Notepad or whatever else you want. And then you've got this program. And you can look at this more carefully and see, okay, here's all of the code you need. You save this with a .html extension, and you open it in any modern web browser, and there's your game. Okay, so come back next time, and I'll show you how to build a custom game. Here's a quick preview. We'll look at the car, run that, and you'll see we can actually create a vehicle that we can drive. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, I'll see you next time. Take care.